Hello everyone, welcome to your course AI for Art, Aesthetics and Creativity. Today we have a very special speaker, uh, Prof. from OpenAI, and he's going to talk about um, generating art and uh, uh, artistic work and images in general, these uh, diffusion models and uh probably you have already worked with the glide collab so he's going to walk us through that as well uh so let's get us started uh Prof, i always ask if please you can share with us what motivates you uh working in this space and also giving us a little background about yourself for oh, sure uh thanks for having me here today by the way this, this is really exciting um yeah, so the background about me, uh, so I was an undergrad at MIT uh, in computer science and math. And then after that, um, I came to OpenAI to do AI research and uh, I've been here for five years doing research on unsupervised learning, generative models, reinforcement learning, all kinds of things. Uh, and what motivates me uh, to do this research? I guess I was kind of like, when I was in college, I was excited by the idea of like just trying to understand, you know, what makes humans intelligent. Uh, and I think I attended a few talks, which which were like really amazing. And I felt like there's a lot of amazing progress happening in this field. And I just wanted to be part of it, see what's happening, see what I could contribute. Uh, and then one thing led to another. And here I am. Um, I think uh, I think so far. Uh, wouldn't say we are very close to unraveling what makes humans intelligence, but we've made a lot of progress, I think, in these years. Uh, so it's been pretty fun. Uh, cool then. Um, so I just get started. Um, and anyone, yeah, feel free to just ask any question at any point. Um, pause me if anything feels confusing, if any notation. Is, is an understood. I don't see the chat window on my screen directly. So if you could just like directly like tell your question, that would be easier. Or if Ali, if you see something in the chat, just let me know. Sounds cool. great. I'll get started. Um, so I'll begin by just showing a few examples of you know very powerful creative ML models from past few years. Um, the first one you all might have already seen. Uh, in news, uh, GPT-3, the language model from OpenAI. Uh, and, you know, one example I'm showcasing here is like these language models. You could show like a very few examples of something pretty simple, like here, like on the left, you see examples of like poems by uh, specific like writers. And on the right, then you can see once the model has seen examples of this kind, what it can generate. And it's, it's it's getting poetry from just a few examples. This is this is pretty crazy. Uh, there's a second model I'll show you next. Uh, is the audio playing? Oops. Yeah, we can hear you. Why do we call it a hamburger? But there's no ham in it. Why do we call it a hot dog? There's no dog in it. I don't even care because I'm so happy that you may break every smoke and let your house in the air. It doesn't matter. Let's call me and you dread it. And I will pay me for this. And Um, anyhow, so that was a sample from a model for generating music called Jukebox. And everything here was generated from the model, the music, the singing, how to sing it, how to, you know, like pronounce the lyrics and everything. All the model was given was the lyrics and an artist, and it produced all of this by itself. Does the generative uh, model like produce the music and like the sentence separately or together? Uh, everything together. Yeah. So uh, because... Uh, Kind of how you sing something kind of has to go with the music that's provided vice versa right it's kind of hard to like generate them separately from each other um what was that your question 
So I can read uh, from the chat that uh, people are getting excited. Uh, someone huh. laughs aloud. Another is saying, this is freaking awesome. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, yeah I'm going to share or talk if you like. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't see the chat window. So uh, feel free to just uh, talk. Uh, yeah, we, when we heard samples from like that from these models, we were also amazed. Um, the, the next model I have here is the, the glide model you guys might have seen in the papers. And here you have a model that given a text prompt is generating a visual representation of it or whatever it imagines what that, uh, that text kind of signifies. So you could see, and these are things that are, go back to your point Ali, you made earlier about composition. These things involve a model really having to compose a lot of different concepts together, like robots meditating in a Vipassana retreat, but it is able to imagine this. So in the last few years, I think like ML models for such very hard creative tasks have become really good. And today we'll see like, what, what are some of the kind of concepts driving this progress? And so before I even start down that route, like why are we trying to, you know, from a research perspective, like trying to train models that, you know, create things? Well, one concept here is that, you know, uh, this, as this quote by Feynman says, what I cannot create, I cannot, uh, I do not understand. Um, training models that can, you know, create things, be images, audio, video, and so on, is kind of one of the hardest tasks in those domains. And if, if you really care about whether models can understand images, audio, video, or so on, then one of the best ways to know if you're making progress or if these models are really learning something uh, advanced is to see if they can create really complex things and really hard to understand things. Um, and for people who care about representation learning or something, this is one, one way you can know you're making progress on such stuff. Um, and there has been a lot of progress. Uh, in, in this field of, you know, trying to create things from models or what we call generative modeling. So here you see just in this very small domain of phase generation, uh, things that GANs could create in 2014 versus things that they can create in 2018. Like it's absolutely ast astounding how much progress has happened in the past few years. So what, what is a generative model? Um, so you could think of um, what are inputs here in our data set to look like just a collection of examples, x1, y1, x2, y2, x, and y, and where x here represents, let's say, an image, and y some label or some other information describing this image. And you just have these sampled from some natural distribution of images, so p of x, comma, y. Um, so you could have like images of corgis, ostriches, goldfishes, and so on. And you want to train a model that can learn this distribution. You want to train a model that when asked for a corgi, produces a corgi, when asked for an ostrich, produces an ostrich, or so on. Um, so it wants to learn P of X given Y, like given some label Y, corgi, ostrich, goldfish, or so on. Can I generate a real image uh, or an image that looks real uh, from this distribution? And once such a model is trained, you can use it to generate novel samples. Um, so you could generate corgis, ostrich, goldfishes that are actually real, haven't been seen before, but look like uh, real images. Oops. Um, one of the things I guess that matters is, is how you evaluate uh, such models because if you, if you don't have evaluation metric, you can't tell you're making progress. And we won't go into too much detail here about these metrics, but one of the metrics used was FID for measuring image generation. And what these metrics are trying to capture is like fidelity and diversity. It's like how, how, like so fidelity would mean like how realistic or how correct an image looks versus diversity would be like how many different kinds of images such a model can generate. And oh, um, so GANs were kind of like the state of the art for difficult image generation benchmarks before uh, diffusion models came along, which we will not talk about in our talk today. Um, so the, the progress in diffusion models has been pretty recent. It's been just like the last couple of years, there's been a lot of papers and even in these papers right, you could see like things have been improving since 2020 and you could now generate realistic faces, you know, lots of different uh, categories of images from ImageNet and so on from these models. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting field. And uh, 
these models uh, in one of our recent papers, we showed them to be actually better than GANs at generating images. And so I, I'm pretty excited by these models and uh, that's what I'm gonna cover today. Uh, there's a quick graphic here for like how things look like when diffusion models generate an image. Um, let me just play it again. So let's go to what these models are. Um, as you saw in that graphic, it, you could see that that image was started out looking like noise and you finally got a real image out by like the slow process of noise converting to an image. And what is actually happening behind the scenes here is you have a fixed process that adds noise to a training image. So let's say you start with X zero on the left here as an image. So that's just a, a dog ball on the left. They have a fixed process that slowly adds Gaussian noise to this image. So at each step, you add a little amount of Gaussian noise. And as you go from left to right, by the end, at the last time step T, you have just pure noise left. And what the model is trying to learn is to undo this process. It's trying to reverse it. It's trying to take some noised image and denoise it a little bit, make it a little less noisy and so on. And how do you obtain a generative model out of this? Well, if, if you train a model to reverse noise like this, then at test time, when you actually wanna use the model, you could start with pure noise at the end. You could start with XT. Then you could run it step-by-step step backwards, to remove noise from it and try to produce an image from it. Um, any questions on this uh, diagram? Okay, um, I'll just check the chat too. There was a question there. Um, okay, no questions. Okay, um, so let's remember the notation from your X zero is, 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 your, is an example from the data set, XT, capital T, XT is noise, and there's intermediate steps, X little t's, we call them, where you, you have like some slightly noised image. And we can, if, to, if, to introduce more notation here, um, we could represent one step of the forward noising process with a distribution Q of X little t given X little t minus one. And right now I'm gonna use Gaussian noise as, as a noising process. So we're gonna add a little bit of Gaussian noise to this. All you wanna think about here is this in this notation, there's some mean which is centered around the original noised image X t minus one. And there's some variance one minus alpha t here of how much noise that is being added to this image. So this is, the forward process. This, this is the process that adds noise to images, Q of XT given XT minus one. What we are learning is the reverse thing. We wanna denoise this image. So we are learning P of XT minus one given XT. And what you can show is for very small uh, noising steps where the amount of noise added is very tiny, the reverse process kind of looks like the forward process. Um, this is kind of subtle point, so maybe I'll go in a little bit of an example here. Let's say looking at a single pixel here, it had some real value on the real line, let's say uh, 0.8. And then you added a tiny amount of Gaussian noise to that thing. So it became 0.81 or 0.79 or so on, I mean, depending on what noise you sampled. Now you're given this new value, 0.79, this is the noised value. And you wanna predict the distribution of what could have been the value it came from. If, if the amount of noise added you was, that you added in your step was very tiny amount of Gaussian noise, then the reverse prediction also looks kind of like a Gaussian. So it looks like, oh, it's, it's somewhere around 0.79, some distribution that where you came from. But, I mean, 0.8 is pretty close to 0.79 in this situation. Um, and so you could write that down as a model that is predicting the mean of this reverse process and the variance of this reverse process, mu theta being the mean and sigma theta here being the variance that you're trying to predict. Uh, so far, so good. Um, any questions at this point?
Okay, so to summarize the notation again, x, xt minus one to xt is a process that's adding noise. And the process we are trying to learn is xt to xt minus one to reverse this noise. And this looks like a Gaussian in the forward direction and predicting a new Gaussian in the reverse direction. Um, a paper showed you could do some forms of training tricks to make this process simpler. You don't have to add noise little by little at every step. You could just directly sample an intermediate x little t given your data example by just adding a lot of Gaussian noise to it. And it also showed instead of trying to predict the mean of the reverse process, you could just directly try to predict what noise was added to the image. This is possible because you could write the mean in terms of the noise that was added. Um, trying to predict the variance is can, can be just simplified to just using a fixed variance or a learned variance. We won't go into that today. All you should get from this is that to predict the reverse process where you are trying to predict the mean and the variance of the Gaussian to reverse that noising process, it's enough to kind of try to predict what noise was added to the image. So how does this look like at, when you're actually training these borders? You take an image x0, you sample some random noise, you sample some Gaussian noise, and you just combine these two to produce a noised xt. Um, there's a formula here of how we've combined them you can think of uh, this combination as something that is kind of like interpolating between the image and the noise. So at t close to zero, you should just get the image x zero and t close to capital T, you should get complete noise. And this kind of interpolation factor alpha t bar kind of plotted it here, it goes from like one near t equals zero to zero near t equals capital T. This kind of controls how you interpolate between a fully like denoised image versus a fully noised thing. And at training time, you're just sampling all possible combinations of mixing of noise and image, and you're trying to denoise all these combinations. So what is the, the model trying to do now? It's trying to predict, as we said in, in the earlier slide, it's trying to predict what noise was added into the image. So you take in the noised XT, you take in, you know, what time step or kind of like a, uh, an indication of where in the process you are, you tell the network, hey, I am at this step in the process. This is my noised image. What noise was possibly added to this image? So it's trying to predict epsilon. And what it's being used to train with is just like simple L2 loss, like just take the mean squared error of the difference between the network's prediction and the actual noise that you trained with, and you try to minimize this lost so that you can train the network to predict what noise was added into the image. So intuitively, you can think of this as like, well, if I'm given a noised image and if I can predict what noise was added to it, I can kind of like subtract that noise out, right? To try to get a real image out. And this is kind of what is happening when you're training a diffusion model. It's learning to denoise images. Any questions so far? No, no questions. Okay. Um, so what, what does the model that kind of does this denoising usually look like? Um, kind of models that we have in our papers usually look like these convolutional unit style models where the U kind of signifies kind of like how the, the shape of the, uh, the model here in this picture is looking like, but to think of it as, is just like a model that runs a bunch of convolutions of the images, it kind of like down samples the image down into smaller and smaller uh, spatial fields so that it can like learn features at different levels of granularity and then kind of upsamples it back into something that looks like a prediction of a noise. Um, I don't have to go into the details of architectures, but just to give you an example of what kind of neural nets are trained to perform this task, this is how they look like. So, okay, we have a model that is trying to now denoise images. It's trying to predict the noise that was added to an image. How do we go back to actually getting a generative model out of this? As we talked about it in an earlier slide, it's equivalent to predicting um, the 
mean of the reverse process. Like you can write down the mean of the reverse process in terms of uh, the noise prediction. So now that you have a network that can predict the, the noise that was added, you can also write down a network that can predict the mean of the reverse process. And once you have something that can tell you the mean of the reverse process, you can run the reverse process backwards. So you can start with noise xt, you could run, you could sample from this reverse process p of xt minus one given xt, you know the mean and we have fixed the variance to something. So you do one step of sampling from this process. You do one more step, one more step and so on. And as we talked about, what we're doing was denoising, right? We're trying to like learn a process that removes noise from images. So if you start from pure noise and you're denoising it one step at a time, by the end of the process, you would have something that looks like a real image. Um, so, so what we've covered so far is how you train these models and how you sample from these models. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so, okay, a uh, bunch of theory there, but what you should remember is you train for denoising and you can derive a sampler from it once you've trained for denoising. What do you do next? Well, you could now make the model class conditional. You could provide labels at training time. So you could provide, uh, you know, let's say you're training on ImageNet or something, you could have labels that say, this image is a goldfinch or this image is a corgi or so on. And you could make the model, the denoising model class conditional. You could provide these labels, the model so that given this label, it tries to produce an image from P of X given Y, like the distribution of images uh, that are kind of represented by this label. And it's pretty simple. You just throw in a label into the model at some point so that uh, it now has this extra information when it's trying to denoise images. You could also do something like upsampling. You could ask the model, given this low resolution image, what would be kind of the high resolution image that could be generated from this? So again, just like throwing in a label Y, you can throw in uh, a low resolution image uh, as extra conditioning information into the model as it tries to denoise. So you've, we've now talked about models that are class conditional. The thing is, if you just train models like this, where you give them a label for an image and you train them for producing the image given the label, they're not very good at doing this out of the box. They kind of produce very incoherent samples. And one of the tricks that we developed to kind of fix this was the trick of guidance, where what you do is you train a model to look at the images that are being generated use a classifier to classify what is the label of this image. So you kind of look at a noisy image and you're like, you know, whether you ask the model, hey, does this look like a dog or not? Um, so you train a classifier on these noisy images. Then you take a gradient of the classifier. You ask the classifier, hey, how can I increase the likelihood to make this image look like a dog? Because you can run the classifier forward, you can get a get a probability from the classifier of it being a dog, you can also differentiate this uh, function to get the gradient of how to change the image so that this probability increases. And then you augment your diffusion model with such a classifier to kind of guide it towards generating images that are more likely to be classified as a dog by the classifier. So how do we end up doing this in practice? Okay, so you can train a classifier on noisy images. You can just take your data set of images, noise them, and train a classifier to predict the label of the noisy images. And then how do you guide now your generative diffusion model to use this classifier? Well, you run the classifier on the noisy images. You predict a probability of you know, the class label under the classifier. So whether something is a dog or not, you take the gradient of this prediction to obtain kind of direction for which the model should change its input to increase the probability of this image. You kind of add this direction into the mean of the reverse process that you were already going towards. Um, so in terms of the actual formula, it just looks like adding an extra term to your uh, mean prediction, which is 
the gradient of the log probability of the prediction of the label given the noisy image. Questions on this, because this is, this is important and this could be a little complicated. It seems there are two questions uh, before this. Uh, can you read them? Oh. Or should, should I read? Yeah. Do you still need a classifier once the model is trained? Um, so here by the model, you mean the diffusion model, right? Um, yes, you still need it because uh, it, it is part of the sampling process. You're using gradients directly from the classifier in the sampling process. So you still have to keep the classifier around when you sample from the model. Okay, let me look at the next question. What is the underlying representation of the classes for condition? Uh, I'm not sure I followed the question, Ben. Could you? Uh, explain. Okay. Uh, um, I have another question. Um, the S in the term, is that just a hyperparameter or? Yeah, we, we'll get to that uh, term in the next slide. But yes, that is just a uh -huh. hyperparameter. The, the, the main thing uh, from this slide is like, we previously had a reverse process that looked like a Gaussian with some mean mu and some variance sigma. We now have a modified reverse process where we've just modified the mean mu with an extra term, which is scaled by this hyperparameter S, has the variance in it kind of for appropriate scaling as well. And it has this gradient term, which is the gradient of a classifier on noised images. And we are kind of basically using this gradient to kind of, kind of guide the model towards directions where the classifier would predict a higher uh, likelihood of the label being correct for the noised image. So that the conditional uh, model produces an image that is more correct. Um, uh, another question, why, why is the variance in the uh, additional term uh, also included? Uh, that, that's just how it popped out from the derivation. Um, it, oh, okay. Uh, I guess you can think of it as kind of like the step size of these things is controlled by the variance. So if you have uh, a Gaussian with a very small uh, mean in the reverse process, then you don't want to take a really large step with your gradient because you'll really you'll pop out very far from where the reverse process should have taken you. So if the reverse process is taking really small steps, uh, which kind of can be thought about by its variance, then you also want to change that process only by that much amount. Does that make sense? I see. So I, I guess the variance term is like a cap in step size. Uh, right. It's like the, the maximum and the uh, class var gradient is maybe somewhere between zero and one or something like that, or? Uh, I don't know if it has any uh, explicit range here, but I mean, it's kind of mostly just direction. Yeah, uh, yeah, fair enough. And you're kind of scaling this direction by a step size. Yeah, okay. Thanks. And the extra hyperparameter is if you want to kind of like make these steps bigger or smaller than what is naturally there. So that's the extra parameter S that we'll talk yeah. about in the next slide. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So the parameter S here. So what we found was if you just actually use the, the step size that pops out from the derivation, so S being one, no, no hyperparameter, it kind of doesn't do that much. It, so on the left, you see the samples with S being one, they don't look like any image from any particular class. But it turned out when we added this extra hyperparameter and just bumped it up. So you have scale 10 here on the right, they actually start looking like samples from uh, the distribution of a particular class. Um, so you can think of this extra hyperparameter S as kind of helping the model focus on the, on the modes of the, the distribution because you're kind of narrowing down uh, the possible things that it produces. At least that's what we saw empirically. Uh, however, the, the, the trade-off here is because you're narrowing it down, well, they also kind of start looking similar to each other, uh, the images that are produced. 
Um, but anyhow, the way to think about the scale factor here is just that it's controlling how much guidance you're using, how much is the classifier influencing the final outcome. And when you use a small value for S, it's not influencing that much. When you use a large value, it's influencing a lot. And the effect of that influence is you're kind of collapsing your distribution towards the modes of whatever the classifier thinks is kind of the best representation of that label. So a very high scale will just collapse to the, the thing that the classifier is most likely to classify as that label, which is not always what you want. You want some kind of diversity in what you produce. So there's some, there's some like intermediate value of scale that is kind of the best that you want to use. And this is kind of how the process looks like in practice here. On the bottom you here, you have your usual like diffusion process with scale. Uh, let me see, I can't see the image. So scale zero, you're just using no guidance. And then when you turn on guidance, you now you're using the gradients of the classifier, kind of nudge the process in the direction where it's more likely to produce that butterfly. As you bump the scale up even higher, you're nudging it even further out from its original reverse trajectory into this new trajectory where it's now producing a very clear butterfly. So the scale parameter is kind of controlling how much guidance is happening and how much the model is being nudged out from its original distribution towards this new better distribution. Um, so you could do similar things instead of labels, you could now have text description of images. So same model class, you're still conditioning on something, but this conditioning thing why instead of being a label is now a piece of text that say robots meditating in a Vipassana retreat. Um, and you could train basically the same kind of models. All you have to now change is, well, you don't have a classifier now, right? There's no classifier that is predicting a label. You, are the, you have to predict the whole sentence if you try to do that. Uh, so how can we do guidance in this situation? Well, first, uh, let me go in. Wait, did I skip a slide? Oh. Okay, well, first let me go into how you can even pass in conditioning information to diffusion models, uh, which look like text. You just, you can just simply run a transformer on the text and just attend to the representations of the text in the model. Um, this is not too important. It's just a pictorial representation of how to deal with text being passed into these models. You can just run a transformer uh, model on this and just have your, original convolutional unit architecture attend to this model when it's trying to do the denoising. Um, but back to guidance, how do you actually guide when you have text as the kind of label information? Well, one of the things you could do is use clip. Um, I think you guys covered clip in a uh, previous lecture, Ali, you said that, so you can... Yeah, it sounds, sounds good. Yeah, so I, I'll skip clip. Okay, uh, but, so I'm assuming you guys all know clip, but basically clip is a model where you have an image encoder and a text encoder, and it's trying to predict how close are the representations of the image and the text. And so you can use clip for guidance. You can ask, hey, I have this noised image. I have this text description, run the image encoder, run the text encoder from clip. How close are these representations? If they are close, then you're gonna get uh, a high dot product here. You can take a gradient of this dot product and get a direction to increase this dot product. And that's the gradient you're, you're gonna use for guidance. You're gonna ask the model, hey, can you increase this uh, dot product? So the image, the, not, the image that you're trying to produce from the reverse process is close in representations to the representation of the text that you have provided. So this is how clip guidance works. A different thing you can do, which we showed in a, uh, which was showed in a paper on classifier free guidance, is you could skip the classifier completely, and just train a usual diffusion model for uh, for reversing the process, but train it sometimes without labels. So sometimes don't don't tell it what was the the text that described an image, and then at test time you ask the model which direction should it go given the label, and which direction should it go without the label, and then you move your predictions in the direction of the model predictions when it was given the label. So in the formula here, if epsilon was the epsilon theta xt given y was the prediction of the model with the label and epsilon theta xt given 
the empty set phi was its prediction without the labels, you're kind of taking the difference of these two and using that as your direction to kind of nudge the model in. And again, you have the scale factor S outside of this direction. It's telling the model to move in the direction of the predictions with the label. And when you use S greater than one, you'll be moving a lot more in the direction of the predictions with the label. The, the cool thing about this way of guiding is that you don't need a separate classifier or a clip model or anything. You're just using the diffusion model itself for guidance. You're directly just asking the model its own uh, kind of prediction of which way it should go to increase the probability of the, the generated image being from the correct class. Any questions about classifier free guidance? One question I have is, uh, have you thought about implementing something like, okay, at this, at, at each stage, for instance, let's talk about the butterfly example. At each stage, I want to add something to this image. And so the text, you know, uh, can gradually uh, form the shape, like for, uh, or the image, like, okay, I want the butterfly. And then on top of it, I want this flower. And then this, you know, Mm -hmm. gradually giving more idea of how your butterfly want to be depicted. E because you are doing this in steps for image and then you are injecting the, uh, uh, the tokens from the clip to, to mm -hmm. your, you know, uh, your network for, for image generation. And so what if gradually adding things that you want to um, be in that image? Yeah, um, I've, that's a great question. I haven't done this, uh, like we haven't done this directly, but you can kind of do this, right? You mm -hmm. could like, you could run your reverse process to some point with, with your text conditioning being just the simple thing. Hey, it's a butterfly. Then you could continue with a new text prompt for guidance. Hey, the butterfly looks like this or so on and keep going. Maybe that works, not sure. Uh, you could do something else where you just run the whole process, first generate a butterfly. Then you take the butterfly, you noise it to go back in the process and then rerun it, but now with a different prompt. So you're kind of modifying this generated butterfly in a new direction. Re then, you know, noise it again and rerun it again with a slightly different prompt. So you kind of be like, slowly changing this uh, generation iteratively in these like kind of like iterative modification. Um, in another slide later, we'll show how to do this with something like in painting. But if you just wanted to do it for your direct image, this is maybe how you would do it. Does that kind of answer? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very interesting, uh, you know, thought and uh, yeah, I appreciate your answer. Uh, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I see that in painting could be one way of thinking about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, but what I was trying to say there was like, yeah, uh, you could also do it without in painting uh, by like kind of modifying the full image by like renoising it and reproducing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that also makes sense. Uh, I think that uh, I was also referring to more like just the way that by removing the noise you are you know trying to somehow refine the image uh, this also in the steps could you know add more context to the image um, and there might be different ways of implementing it uh, i yeah i think that's good okay thanks uh, slide okay um so in our, in our guide paper, we kind of compare these two forms of like uh, guidance for text conditional uh, models, clip guidance versus classifier free guidance. Uh, and here are a few samples, like representative samples from the model. So on the left here is, is just samples without any guidance. This is just a pure conditional diffusion model. There is no form of uh, classifier clip guidance or classifier free guidance. And kind of see, you know, it's kind of getting the prompt. So the prompt here is stained glass window of a panda, uh, panda eating bamboo. It's kind of all right, but it's not very coherent. 
then you do clip guidance with scale two, and it starts getting better. But the classifier free guidance one looked the best in you know the the tests we did, and I think part of this might be just that it's it's not exactly the correct thing to use a clip. Uh, part of it just might be that it's kind of a better inductive bias to use classifier free guidance. We, could be a lot of reasons, but at least empirically, this was working better in practice to generate more realistic samples from these models. And you can see guidance does make a big difference in uh, you know, generating more realistic things, but it also does kind of make, you know, this kind of like, mode collapse effect happen. All of these samples kind of start looking a little similar to each other when, when you do a lot of guidance. So um, what, what, what have we done here? We've trained a model that, you know, given a text prompt can generate images and we've done it for this diffusion technique. And this was what uh, we trained in the glide paper. And we then showed that this model actually was beating the older OpenAI model. DALI, which was actually a bigger model, which was trained in a very different fashion. Uh, it was trained use, uh, using an autoregressive model on these like discrete BAE tokens. Uh, and it, the new diffusion model not only generated things that looked a lot more realistic, it actually generated them faster and used fewer parameters. So this new model class is actually a lot nicer to use for these tasks than the older class of models. One cool advantage of these models is also because they're not doing this thing autoregressively there, you know, just generating an whole image, you can do these things that are much harder to do with these older autoregressive models. You can do things like in painting. So you could mask out a portion of the image and then ask the model to kind of fill in that portion. And how, how would you do that? Well, just like we passed our conditioning labels in the past, you could just pass in kind of this like half filled image as extra conditioning information to the model. So you take this image and a mask on top of it, you provide this as extra information to the model when it's trying to run its uh, generative process. And it's gonna try to now think of this as a label. Hey, like this is the image, what are the possible images that correspond to this label or this uh, kind of masked image? What are the things that could complete this image? Um, and what are, you're providing is this uh, kind of like image X zero with a little bit of region masked and a mask M that tells what is the part of the image that has been masked. You can also now do text condition and painting. You could provide an, you know, an image with a mask and you could also provide a text label to tell the model how it should paint the region. So you, these are examples from the grant paper. So on the left here, you have the, the text label being zebras roaming in the field and you have this image with a green mask on it. So the mask region was removed uh, and the model was asked to fill in this image conditioned on this prompt. So now it's gonna to try to fill in not only something that kind of completes the image correctly, like is in the, the dist conditional distribution, but also kind of matches the prompt. Um, on the right here, you see something uh, with a girl hugging a corgi on a pedestal. And it's kind of matching the style of the image very well here. If you can see, it kind of looks like it's like painting and it's like kind of nicely like blended in. So this is a really cool thing, which you can do very easily out of the box with diffusion models, but it's kind of much harder to do with other classes of models. And you could take this idea iteratively, like you could now erase a region of an image. So let's say we erased the region on the left here and you first filled it in with you know, a cozy living room. Then you erased a, a different region uh, and you know, asked for a painting of a corgi on the wall above the couch. Then you get a painting there. Erase another region, put a coffee table, put a flower vase and so on. Um, so this is one way of kind of you know, doing the thing you talked about Ali, where you kind of like, generate things iteratively, but this is doing it through painting. You're erasing regions, you're erasing very specific regions, and then asking the model to fill that region in with the thing you want. So this doesn't cover all kind of modifications that you want to do, but it does cover things that you can represent as like adding things one by one into an image, if that makes sense. Um, so like stuff that you maybe cannot do with this is like, you know, change the style of an image completely, the full thing, because well, if you just erase the whole thing, you couldn't, it wouldn't have anything to condition, it can't change the style. But things like this, where you add things, you could do pretty easily through iterative impainting. Any questions so far on the impainting side of things?
So Lindra is asking if the collab is available for in painting. I think I saw it uh, on the website. The collab shows uh, in painting. Yes, uh, the collab uh, that we released in the Glide repo. The, I think the third one is the or the second one. That, that one does in painting. Um, basically, all you'll have to do there is you'll have to provide this extra image, and you'll have to provide a mask or like mask out a portion of the image, and then provide a mask that tells what has been masked. And then you just run the guided diffusion process as usual, but now with this extra information to try to impaint this region. Um, I, I'll go into kind of the notebook later, but yes, the, the notebook's there. Okay. Diego also has a question. Can you remove objects using painting? Yeah, I mean, so let me go back to the slide. I mean, oops. Uh, I mean, I guess, Technically, in the very first one, we removed the thing, right? We just masked out whatever was on the wall in the left. And here we ended up adding a painting of a colleague, but you could just ask for nothing. Uh, and then it would just fill it with the wall. Um, I don't know if there is an example here. Um, yeah, in all of these things, we kind of change something, modified something. But if you just don't give any prompt, it's just going to try to fill it without any extra information. It's just trying to make the best possible completion. And that would be kind of like removing an object. Does that answer your question? I'm assuming yes, now we'll move on. Okay, um, well, you can take this idea further and you could do out painting kind of. So like previously you drew a mask that was inside the image. But you could also kind of move the rectangle that the model is focusing on outside the image. So now the mask looks like a strip of things around the image that is masked. And you can ask the model to fill that thing. And you could keep moving this rectangle around to kind of expand out from an image. So this is something um, uh, that Holly Herndon did. She like took this central image here and then she kept moving the square out, to kind of expand out. Uh, the canvas of the model and ask it to keep filling in extra information outside of the region. Uh, at the end of the day for the model, there is just like some conditioning information, some mask, and it's gonna just try to fill in in that region, whatever it thinks is the best possible completion. It doesn't have to be inside, it could be outside as well. So one other, I guess, important thing is like, so we talked about the release notebooks, the release notebooks use kind of the released model, which is the, the filtered glide model. So in our paper, we talk about this, where we, if we looked at, you know, kind of the things you could generate with the, the big original Glide model, and there were a lot of like problematic things that it could generate that made it unsafe to release the full big model. So we released a small, smaller model on a filtered data set, and it, it cannot generate like, things that look as impressive as the big model, but it still kind of can generate you know, realistic looking images for like some of these easier prompts. Uh, but yes, there is gonna be a little bit of a performance gap between using the, the filtered small model that has been released versus some of the best images you can see. That said, you can still generate a lot of cool things with the, the small filtered model. So these are some of the things I found on Twitter that people have generated with the, the notebooks that we released. So on the left here, uh, I think what they did was they kind of did the outpainting thing, but they just went kind of like in a panorama fashion, left to right, and kind of kept asking the model to fill these landscapes. And I think they turned up the, the guidance scale a lot to make it very artsy. I think in the right, uh, they've kind of probably like they've done this outpainting thing, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how they got those structures. But I think a part of this, a part of the the fun stuff here is kind of these prompt uh, search or prompt tuning things where you kind of find these prompts that generate very specific kind of artistic styles. Um, and if you find very cool prompts, then you can now use these tricks of out painting and so on to kind of like keep expanding it out to generate these cool pieces of art. Uh, this is another thing I found on Twitter where uh, uh, they trained a classifier free guidance model on conceptual captions. And I think this is like a flower, a space flower with some space uh, uh, art theme. Um, looks super cool. There is a question. Mm -hmm. You want to read it? 
let's see. What did it create? That was dangerous. Um, so, or maybe part... it was a comment. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think I, yeah, what did it create? That was dangerous. Yeah, I, I guess, well, for all details, I would recommend just reading a paper. I mean, there were, and I, I wasn't the one who did the safety analysis here. It was the OpenAI, the, the people who work on safety at OpenAI and Alex. Um, but I think it was stuff like violence. It was stuff that could be used for like deep fakes, for like misinformation and so on. But I mean, these models are pretty powerful. So you could generate lots of things that you don't want to be floating on the internet. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the trade-offs are hard here, right? Because like on the one hand, you do want to, you know, put these powerful models out there in the hands of people to like, you know, generate all these nice cool art and uh, like, like lots of positive use cases, right? But I think you want to also be conservative to not create a lot of like stuff that you don't want floating around on the internet that's associated with your models. I don't know, this, this is a tough trade-off. Uh, I, I think it's it's nice that we can still release some safe model that people can use, uh, but making these models like fully safe, well, they never generate something that is like kind of like not a not a good thing. Uh, it's very hard problem in general. Um, I think you could find more like detailed examples in our paper if you're looking for like specific examples. But that was kind of our line of thinking on like releasing like the small filtered version. Um, okay. Maybe a, a slight tangent, but what, what does the process look like of, let's say, calling, um, you know, the unsafe parts away from, from the model? Like, how do you go about that? Um, yeah, oh, that involves usually, I guess, training these, uh, training kind of like these classifiers to filter out portions of the data set that could be like not safe. Like you could, you know, train an NSFW classifier, you could train a classifier for like, hate symbols, you could train a classifier for like lots of different things. Then you, once you have labeled data on which you can train these classifiers, label data for like, I don't know, real images that you consider things that you don't want a model to generate. And you could run these classifiers on your training data set, filter it out, then train a model on the filtered data set. So hopefully the model will never go into regions where, um, where it can generate something like that because it was never part of the training data. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, just a quick like, some, uh, like look into the notebooks that we've released. This, this is just like some useful um, knowledge. So like there's a few parameters that you will have to like, kind of like deal with when you're trying to generate uh, stuff from the notebooks that we've released. Well, uh, the, there's the two scales we've talked about and I talked today, the classifier free guidance scale and the clip guidance scale small val values for these scales will generate, you know, more diverse, but not very coherent samples. Larger values will generate more coherent things. Very large values will generate like very artsy looking things. So like for classify free guidance scale, like I think three might be the default, but you could try five, 10, 20 or so on to generate more artistic things. Um, similarly for the clip guidance scale. Um, time steps kind of controls like how many little steps you take in the diffusion process. I think by default, we yeah, use 100, so there's 100 steps of like iterative denoising that will happen. So if you use a higher value, it'll look more sharp, but you'll also spend more time generating a sample. Um, so 100 was a good like trade-off that we used in the thing. Finally, the for the in-painting notebook, you would have to provide an extra thing, which is like, what is the region of a given image that you wanna in-paint? So you would have to provide, let's say a 64 by 64 image that you want to impaint and some region in it that you've like removed that you kind of specify with a mask, which is like, I think one in places where the image is not masked and zero in the places where the image is masked. I could be wrong on the zero versus one. So you should check the notebook for which direction. It is. Basically it's a binary mask that tells, hey, this is the portion of the image that is masked. This is the portion of the image that is unmasked. And the rest is like, just a, just a usual image with three channels that you provide as extra information to the model. And do you just upload that as an image file? I think the way in the notebook that works is, so if this is on a collab, you'll have to have the file on drive and then you open it using pillow 
image.open or something. I don't know if there's like a direct upload button. Uh, but I guess but like, I you just... oh, sorry. I guess my question was um, like when you add the mask, like the mask is just like removing part of like a regular image file or is like there's something more to it? Oh, uh, no, yeah. That's just uh, removing parts uh, of the regular image file. So like, I think if you want to do it programmatically, just, just zero out that region. Does that answer the question or? That makes sense, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, there's an example in the notebook. There's a cell in the notebook that kind of masks an image. So that might be more clear where you can see like, you are loading an image from the disk, then you are kind of like removing a region, then you are kind of writing down a mask that specifies what you removed. And then you pass in all this information into the model. And I think that's it for uh, the stuff you will need to kind of like, apply this thing to the notebook. Um, and if you want more further reading or like what we talked about today, I mean, I, have, I try to focus on mostly like things you will need to understand for like kind of generating art from these things, but if you want to go into more detail about the theory of these models. I think the best paper would probably be the Denoising Diffusion Probabilistic Models paper by Jonathan Ho, uh, the DDPM paper um, that has kind of like the basic theory of uh, the models that we talked about today. Then there was our paper on diffusion models with Ganser image synthesis that kind of talks about the guidance trick for classifier guidance. And then the glide paper kind of talks about doing this for text conditional models where we talk about clip guidance and classifier free guidance. There was also the paper by Yang Song, generative modeling by estimating gradients of the data distribution, which kind of like was before the Jonathan Ho paper, which approach this problem from a very different perspective of score matching. And in the DDPM paper, Jonathan Ho and others showed how it's kind of equivalent to score matching. So if you want to understand diffusion models from a different lens, I think I, I would strongly recommend that paper and these two blogs as well by Lillian and Yang on diffusion models and score matching models. They're basically like two sides of the same coin and understanding from both perspectives is super useful to see you know, why these generative models work. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. It was very, very interesting and fascinating uh, and very inspiring. Are there questions? Yeah, this, Go ahead. This Brent. is super cool. Uh, I have a Thank you. quick question. Did you notice if there was any relationship between say, like if you fed it two-dimensional noise and if you were to step through the X or Y coordinates, did you notice if there's any relationship between uh, the coordinates used for two-dimensional noise and the output that you get? Say, say that again? What, what did you say at is, the end? Is there, if, if you use two-dimensional noise, is there a relationship between um, the coordinates that you use for the two-dimensional noise map and the outputs of the model? Like, is there a relationship that 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 you observe between the noise that you use and the model and the uh, the outputs of the model. Okay, uh, uh, there's a little bit. So like one way you can do this is you can like fix the noise that you sample and change the label, and you can see that the generated images for the same noise but different labels kind of have similar like perspective and spatial structure. So like, but but they look kind of like images from different classes. So, um, so the noise definitely controls some aspect of you know how the final output looks like, and there's some kind of spatial like connection, but it's not an exact direct connection. Does that kind of answer your question? Yep, got it. Yeah, yeah and you can see examples of this in our I think uh, diffusion models beat Gans paper. I think that in the appendix we have an example where we like do this specific thing. It's actually more directly connected when you use a different sampling method. So. so I showed you that it's reverse process, right? Where at each step you're doing this uh, reverse step with the Gaussian. So at each step you're adding a little bit of noise when you sample from the Gaussian, but there's a different way of reverse sampling from these models, which is called DDIM. There's another paper on that, where you just sample noise once at the start, and then you just run a deterministic reverse process to sample from the model. In that case, the there's kind of like this one-to-one -one correspondence between the noise and the generated image. And there it's more clear to see this. Got it, thank you. 
I can ask my earlier question again, I guess, if nobody else has another question. Go for it. Um, so I guess if you're using a diffusion model without clip, right? So I guess what's being trained is the classifiers for the labels. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, wait, so for the, the, for the denoising process. Yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to understand if without clip, how does it know what to denoise to without like some representation of the text that you're feeding it? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, if, if you train a model or denoising model without text labels, then it doesn't know where to go. And the only way you can generate a sample for a given text distribution, it would, would be through like clip guidance or something. But we do have, uh, we do train these models to be text conditional, the diffusion model. Um, and in the classifier free guidance case, you train it with or without the labels. So maybe I can go back to one of our slides here. Uh, the way the model, the, the reverse process model sees the text is through this kind of conditioning on the, the representations output by a transformer on the text. Ah, uh, okay, uh, got it. Yeah. Okay, um, got it. So this text conditioning here is without clip. Yes. So the kind of point, okay. I, kind of a point I glossed over uh, in guidance was you could use guidance on top of unconditional models or conditional models. So you could have a reverse diffusion model that isn't conditioned on any labels. Then it wouldn't have any way of actually like producing an image given a class. But then you could use guidance on top to get it to produce an image giving a class, but you could also use guidance on top of conditional models themselves. So you could have your original model be able to produce an image given text like we did here, but also use guidance on top to make it even better at doing this. And Got it, okay, this, yeah. I think saw this one in practice. Oh, sorry, go okay, ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. If are there more questions? Okay, uh, well, I think that uh, we can wrap up the session. Uh, I again want to thank you a lot, uh, Profil, and uh, it was it was great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. And uh, feel free to just like email me any questions later or. DM me on Twitter with questions. Uh, but yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff out happening in this. So like, I would strongly recommend doing some of the, the like reading some of the blogs or reading just like uh, things that you can find um, in other collab notebooks as well. 